Morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the first nine verses. If you're visiting us this morning, welcome. We're glad you're in for the holiday, if that's why you're visiting, but we're more glad that you joined us for worship today, and uh, we invite you to just participate as you feel uh, comfortable and join us as we celebrate Jesus together. We have been looking in this series in the past uh, four weeks now, the chapters of Luke 11, 12, and now 13. And I want to remind you what Jesus has been teaching in these particular chapters as Luke recorded them. He's been talking about the things that keep us from hearing God, the things that keep us from discovering who he is and listening to his voice as he leads us. Things like hypocrisy and greed, a lack of focus, uh, listening uh, or seeing the works of God and attributing them to something else, not giving credit where credit is due to the hand of God involved in your life. And as we've looked at that, Jesus has been challenging us to go beyond that, to open our ears and our hearts to what God is doing so that we can respond to him. And then a moment happens in chapter 13 that's really indicative of a lot of the questions that we ask each other as believers, and it's the question, why do people suffer? It's a question that's asked silently amongst many believers, and I believe as a pastor it's one of the reasons most people don't become Christians is because they can't reconcile this issue of suffering in the world and the goodness of God. And there was a moment that the question was posed to Jesus indirectly, and he responds. And I want us to look at that today. It's in the first five verses. So we asked the question, why do people suffer? In verse 1, now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. They were sacrificing to God, and Pilate killed them and used their blood as a Uh, an offensive sacrifice. Jesus answered, verse 2, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? Now, one of the questions that in my research I uh, found significant was when Jesus refers to them as Galileans, you can take that word out because that doesn't mean as much to you as it did to them. And I want you to insert any word or terminology about a group of people that you can't stand. So identify a group of people who just aren't what you think they ought to be, and that's the question Jesus posed. When, do you think what these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in uh, Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Their question to Jesus was, you heard what happened, right? And Jesus said, yes, I did. Did God make that happen because they were bad? Was this the punishment of God on them because they were really, really bad? And Jesus said, no. Because if that happened to them, then what's going to happen to you? Wow. This isn't a sweet, gentle Jesus, is it? This Jesus saying, no, no. If people suffered simply because they were wrong, then every single person will suffer at the hand of God. Do bad things happen to us because of the bad things we've done? And this is a question that we still ask today. We hear of tragedy and consequence, and we are asking, is sin and suffering connected? And Jesus' response is, it is, but not the way you think. Sin and suffering are connected because sin brought suffering into our world. The reason this world is a mess is we made a mess of it. And they were saying, did God get back at those Galileans? Were they bad, and that's how God punished them? This is a question that's gone on throughout all of Scripture. It's a question that's been asked and answered, asked and answered, asked and answered. But even in our day today, we reason, we make God in our own image, so we assume if something bad really happens to a person, they must have really been a bad person. And if something good happens to a person, then they should, they're probably a pretty good person. If you catch a break, it's because God likes you. And if you get smoked, it's because God can hardly stand you. It's the way we reason. And the reasoning was, this happened to people that were worshiping God. They must have done something terribly wrong. This goes all the way back to the book of Job. Job suffers simply as a test of his faith. And his friend says to him, in response to how this happened, he says, according to what I have seen, Those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they come to an end. Man's reason. 
if bad things happen, you're a bad person. If good things happen, you must be a good person. But then we run into life, don't we? And what we witness is that some good things happen to some good people, that's okay. And when bad things happen to bad people, that's okay. But what happens when bad things happen to pretty good people? And what happens when good things happen to some pretty bad people? Then we're in trouble. We, we say, that's not right. That's not just. Or let's go back to our 70-year-old selves. That's not fair. Huh. We all do that, don't we? Jesus pointed out that the death in the temple were indeed tragic. But tragedy is what we did to our world. Tragic things happen when sin has broken all that God made pure and right. So the question of the morning is, does God zap us because of our sin? And the answer is no. We've zapped ourselves because of our sin. And if you didn't get zapped by your own choices, you got zapped by someone else's sinful choices. And the events, even nature, when nature rebels, nature is groaning against this because it has all fallen apart when sin entered the world. God has not stopped suffering, and some of us struggle with that. But be assured, God does not cause suffering. And that's what they were asking Jesus that morning. You see, Jesus denies the concept of karma. Jesus denies that you get what you've earned. Because church, if we got what we earned, do we really want that? I'm gonna say no. Now for this kid, no. I don't want what I've earned. I want what Jesus earned. And that is hope and life and peace and righteousness. You see, the one thing that brings suffering into our world is sin, and we are all full of sin, and we are the cause of all suffering. So yes, is sin and suffering Connected, absolutely, but not for the reasons we think. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death. It isn't that small sins have no consequences and big sins have big payoffs. All sins have the same punishment, physical and eternal death. So I know this is harsh on a crisp fall morning when we've all gathered on Thanksgiving weekend, but here's the truth. You can take all of your vitamins, you can become a vegan, You can buckle up every time you drive. You can run six miles a day. You can drink only purified water and you're still gonna die. So let's go home and finish that pie, amen? (laughs) All right, now we're together. Now some of us are gonna die many years from now and some of us are gonna die, unfortunately, closer to today. You see, death in all of its iterations is the result of a poison that temptation never talks about and always delivers. Suffering is a part of a broken world. It's not God's punishment. And only God himself can use suffering to get us through life when it seems like what we wanted to do is stop suffering altogether. You see, sometimes we suffer because of things we do. Don't pay attention. Don't pack your parachute properly. Don't treat a gun with respect. And you could suffer. You can suffer because of other people's actions. 9-11. School shootings are perfect examples. You can suffer because of random choices. A minuscule percentage of people will be hit by lightning and die. You can suffer because of the work of the evil one. Satan is set out to bring suffering because what suffering has proven to do is if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, when you suffer, you hate God. But as a believer, when you see the suffering of Jesus on our behalf, you can actually find a deeper love for God even in suffering. You see, the truth of the matter is, suffering is a result of our rebellion, and if not your own personal rebellion, the rebellion of this entire world because of sin. So Paul wants us to say, when you see suffering, don't ask the wrong question. Don't assume that you can see it all in the moment you're in, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the anguish. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I believe what Paul is telling us here is that you can only see dimly, but one day you'll understand all of it, and even suffering will make sense to us on the other side because God will have redeemed it. God will have fixed all those things that were broken. We live by faith, not by sight. 
And we're asking the wrong questions when we think we can draw judgment on God because suffering still exists. It's why I believe that most people that I've talked to who know who Jesus is can't reconcile that with the suffering going on in the world and saying, why hasn't God stopped it? We're asking the wrong question. Why has he allowed us to live? Not why has he allowed us to suffer. You see, because even in the suffering, God can redeem this. And so what's funny is, they ask him, did God cause this suffering, or where is God when suffering happens? And Jesus is trying to say, I'm here. I entered into your suffering. I'm never going to abandon you in your suffering. In fact, I'm going to suffer for you what you could not stand to suffer alone. And then Jesus' response is interesting. It's a challenge of repentance. Repentance. They said, do these people suffer because they're bad? And Jesus said, no, but you better repent because you're bad. That's kind of a nice response, isn't it? In fact, he says it twice in five verses. You need to repent. Repentance is the only alternative to perishing. It's not even optional. It starts with a choice based on truth. Now listen to me. Repentance begins with truth, not passion, emotion, or desire. Repentance is not a feeling. Repentance is a reality, and it's a reality based on truth, because death is the common denominator for everyone. Repentance will not eliminate suffering, but it will give it a purpose. You see, true repentance can be defined three simple ways. The first one is confession. I'm going to show you what repentance is in three dimensions, and these dimensions in their entirety allow you to understand how to repent. Repentance begins with its confession, its volitional, it's the mind, it's the will, that it's your volition, it's your choice. And confession is the mind agreeing with God when you've disagreed previously. It is seeing the truth and trusting him with the truth. What you previously did, you did not consider to be a sin, but as you trust the words of God and you understand the character of God and the holiness of God, you can say to God, I was wrong. In fact, here's the words that when you understand the truth of God, here's words you'll say more often than you've ever said them before. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. There's no excuse. I did it. I stole. I lied. I cheated. I hurt you. I was bitter, I was angry, I'm guilty. Romans 12:1 tells us what this is about. Do not be conformed to this pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It begins with confession. It's saying those crucial words, I was wrong, God, you were right. And then it leads us to contrition. When we know what the truth is, and we're not gonna fight against the truth, but we're gonna trust God with the truth, then it allows us to enter into contrition, which is emotional. This is what the Hebrew word heart stands for. Not feelings, but the makeup of who you are as, as an entity. It's emotional expressions that are sincere and real. It's the weight of your sin and the pressure that it holds on you. It's what Isaiah, in Isaiah 57, speaking for God, the prophet wrote these words, I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God is not trying to get you to repent so he can shame you and own you. He's trying to get you to understand that you're never more beautiful to him, you're never more open to his love than when you realize it's all you need. It's not a shame thing. It's a, an invitation to give him your heart and not just your head. Many of us believe that repentance is simply saying, I am sorry. What, you got caught? That people know about it? That you didn't get away with it? Or are you sorry that you actually believed the lie to do it? That you believed that you could eat the fruit of the tree and not pay the price for the theft? This is what the garden was all about. They didn't trust God. They didn't believe he was good enough and they didn't believe he was wise enough. And so when we understand the truth and Jesus reveals to us what the truth is, then when we violate that truth, it's no longer excuse-making or blame-shifting. It's actually, I love this term, you own it. You say, I did that. I hate myself for doing that. I wish I would never would have done it. I bought the lie. I ate the fruit. I'm paying the price. 
So it becomes emotional. Paul would also say in 2 Corinthians, godly sorrow brings repentance. And worldly sorrow only brings death. Why? Because worldly sorrow doesn't cause you to repent. It just causes you to stay dead. Godly sorrow produces a repentance that brings life. So you have confession, the mind. You have contrition, the heart. And you have change, the behavior. You want to stop. You want to change. You want to learn. You want to grow. And this isn't a one-stop shopping trip. So please don't hear me today, because I know there are some of us in this room struggling with addiction. Some of us are struggling with this repeated behavior and habits that we've built into our lack of character, and we continue to do the things we hate to do. Please understand that repentance is a daily thing. It's not a one-time activity in which all of a sudden everything is going to be perfect. No, that change needs to come the right way. And so when you understand that you're wrong and your heart hurts that you're wrong, you'll start doing the things that are right. You'll start returning. You're moving toward sin. You turn and you run toward God. Like the prodigal son who realizes his life's choices were miserable, he said, I'd rather go back and be a servant of my father then stay in the condition I'm in. When you're there, your behavior will follow your mind and it'll follow your heart. You're moving toward death. You turn and you go toward life. You're moving toward damaging behavior. You turn and you run toward the truth. By the grace of God, you want to keep going in this direction. You want to run home. But what suffering does, and Satan uses suffering in every one of our lives, when suffering comes, instead of realizing that with God I can get through this, we blame God for it. If he really loved me, this wouldn't happen to me. God's love is not the cause, God's lack of love, rather, is not the cause of your suffering. Our sinful choices are, remember, God doesn't zap you with suffering because you've made him mad. You zapped yourself with suffering because you made yourself God. And we're asking the wrong questions and then wondering why we're not finding the right answers. In Acts chapter 5, verse 31, God exalted Jesus to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. You see, repentance is a gift. And we have to receive it to use it. So we change our behaviors because Jesus entered into our suffering. You see, God didn't cause it And God isn't stopping it. What he did instead was he sent Jesus into it so that even Jesus could redeem suffering in this world. Repentance means we don't minimize it, we don't hide it, we don't excuse it, we don't tolerate it, we don't nurture it, we don't embrace it, we don't defend it, we own it. Yeah, I did that. And I wish I hadn't. And the suffering I cause others because of it even makes me more sick at my choices. You see, Christians are not the nicest people. We're not the most consistent people. We're not the most intelligent people. But by God's grace, we should be the most teachable and humble people, shouldn't we? Open to saying, you're right, I was wrong. You see, you leave those choices by following the light rather than into the darkness. And then Jesus ends this teaching that Luke records with the parable. He tells a story, and it's a story of hope. So if right now you're like, I still don't like this, you don't have to like the truth for it to be true. God does not cause it. God has not stopped it. Suffering still exists, but he entered into it. Let me explain. Luke chapter 13, verses six through nine. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the gardener replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I think the big mistake we can make in this particular teaching is to equate the owner of the vineyard with God. Now, in some of Jesus' parables, that is the imagery. It's not in this one. The gardener is Jesus. The owner is just a depiction of someone who's wanting productivity. And if you make the owner of the field God, I think you're writing God in your image rather than in his his own, as he's revealed it. So a man has a field, and I'm told in my research that a fig tree will start to produce figs in the third year. 
In the third year, the owner shows up and he's irritated because there's no figs for him on that tree. So he says to the gardener, get rid of that tree. It's a worthless tree. Now, if you see you and me as the tree, you're probably hearing the parable correctly. In other words, has anybody in this room done all that they should have done for the one who gave us the opportunity to do anything? I would say I haven't. So I can't stand in front of God and say, I did, I took every opportunity you gave me and I honored you with every little bit of it. I can't say that. Couldn't even begin to say that. But the gardener sees the tree and says, please, let me have one more year. Let me nurture it, let me fertilize it, let me, let me prune it, let me get rid of all the things around it that are drawing resources from it. Let me give it focus. In other words, let's show it mercy for one more year and see if it doesn't produce fruit. What is Jesus wanting us to see? That God is a God who's giving us a chance. He's giving us a chance when we've not been productive to produce a fruit that will only come at his caring nurture. Are you with me, church? This is not a parable of judgment, although there will be moments that he will separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares, that he will judge the believers from the unbelievers. There is a moment, but in this parable, what he's saying is, when there's time to repent, take it. Because it's only given to you by the mercy of God. Based on a judgment, not a single person, believer or unbeliever, will ever stand before God and say, you owe me. But every one of us will stand before God and say, have mercy. And through Jesus Christ, he did. That's what this parable is telling us. You see, what I want you to understand is that within this parable is this harsh truth. There comes a time when the next chance to repent may be your last chance to repent. Now, some of us just went back to our old church days, right? Oh, here he goes. Turn or burn, baby. Get saved this morning. You might get smoked in the parking lot. Well, that's a reality. I can't help you there. But I'm not saying, I'm telling you this. When Jesus said, I'm going to give you another year of life to cultivate you, fertilize your environments, prune back all the unnecessaries. When God's trying to do this, Jesus is saying, I think you should take advantage of that. And what would we say? Absolutely. It's not just be fearful you might die right now. Be fearful you never started living. Live in such a way that you take the opportunities of God's mercy and grace. He's not a God who's out to smite us. He's a God who wants to nurture us. He wants to grow us. But remember, there comes a time when the chance to repent becomes the last chance you get to repent. Don't take this extra year to produce fruit and do nothing with it. Romans chapter two, verse four. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? You see, if you fear God in in an unhealthy way, if you fear that he's against you and he's causing you to suffer and he's gonna really smoke you one day, you don't know God. Look at Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Was Jesus out to condemn and judge and annihilate people? Absolutely not. Jesus was the one saying, let me nurture another year. Give me another chance to work with them, to show them mercy and grace that will lead to repentance. If we live our whole lives just to be saved, we are missing the chance to live. John 15, 4, Jesus said, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you and you'll bear much fruit. See, this is our purpose, Ephesians 2. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone to do the good works he prepared in advance for us to do. Our purpose is not just to survive, it is to be fruitful. And being nurtured by Christ This is what it's down. You see, normally in a productivity world, a tree that doesn't produce after three years needs to be gotten out of the soil so that a good tree could be planted there. And for many of us, that's what Christianity is. I'm here to tell you this parable says no. If Jesus was based on productivity, none of us would be left. Because he's based on mercy and grace. Today we have the privilege of worshiping him here, don't we? And throughout the world, millions if not billions of people will worship Jesus Christ because he's patient, he's kind, and he's calling us to repent. Suffering is not from God, but mercy is. 
See, God wants to encourage you today. God wants to love you today. God wants to grow you today. God wants you to hear the voice of Jesus saying, no, we're not gonna cut you down. We're gonna give you time. Isn't that a blessing? God is not out to get you unless getting you means he gets all of you so you can live. He's not to send you away. He's not to punish you or to strike you. The suffering in this world is because of the choices we make in a sinful world that has ruined everything God gave us. So how do I become fruitful? How do I remain planted and rooted in Christ? I'm going to give you four very simple things. Begin to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. How do you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Same way Jesus told us. Abide in Jesus. Listen to his words. Obey his truth. And seek the evidence around you of the work of God. Repent of sins as God reveals them to your heart. Each and every time that you and God disagree, you're wrong. Admit it. Own it. Say, I was wrong. I got selfish. I got scared. I didn't trust you. Be honest about it. Because God can work in your honesty. He cannot work in your falsehood. That's of Satan. Measure fruitfulness, not busyness. See, that's the biggest problem for the American Christian today is we have so many things we have to be doing that we're not doing the one thing we have to do. Love God, love your neighbor. Seek first his kingdom. But don't equate holiness with busyness. They're two separate things. In fact, you can't be both holy and busy. Be faithful, there's a big difference. Produce fruit. Produce the things that God has embedded you in. The fruit of the Spirit, which comes from obedience and trust. And be discipled by fruitful people. Christianity is not something you walk alone. You walk in community. You choose Jesus for yourself, but you walk in family. You walk in community. I love Maggie's communion thought. At the equivalence of gathering around our tables with friends and family to celebrate a great feast and appreciate one another is the same thing we do in the Lord's Supper, and it's the same thing the church does each and every day. The word of the morning is... What are we going to do in a world where bad things happen to good people? We're going to serve Jesus Christ and watch him redeem that and watch him dry every tear and, and give us hope and joy in the midst of a suffering world, just as he did. Look at the cross and understand that God did not abandon us in our suffering, but he entered into our world to join us. May we have faith in the one who, even in the midst of our suffering, promised, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Let's stand together.